Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to this round table on constitutional reform. My name is Nico Heller and this is Reboot 2030, the Democracy School's YouTube channel and podcast. Written constitutions, such as the American and the German constitution, are treated often almost like divine texts or divine laws, timeless and eternal, that can be referred to by anyone, but only a chosen few, constitutional judges, are allowed to interpret them when it comes to legal disputes. Yet all constitutions are products of their time and to maintain relevance and legitimacy sometimes need amending or reforming. Kenya is a case in point. Following the post-election violence that broke out after the December 2007 presidential elections, a reform process was set in motion that led to the adoption of a new constitution in 2010. Now, this was a highly participatory multi-stage process involving various factions, uh, and it, as these processes always do, it had a pacifying effect in itself because it got people talking again after the election. Um, so, it, you know, th there's always that. But, um, and of course, we don't know what would have happened if that reform process hadn't taken place. But there seems to be a, a kind of a consensus that it contributed significantly to the stabilization of Kenyan democracy post 2007. So these processes, apart from providing some comp like a compass for the future, they are often also quite useful to work through legacy issues uh, to do with the past. Now, in this round table on constitutional reform, we look at three very different settings or contexts, the US, a mature or old democracy, with you know a whole set of issues which most of our listeners would be quite familiar with, this highly polarized society, um, you know, and they're, you know, they're, they're kind of issues around populism, the issues around sort of radicalization, but really probably more importantly, um, there is an increasing difficulty to even come together around what would have been considered issues of national interest in the past. So um, what seems to be happening in the US at the moment isn't just in a way undermining or affecting American democracy, but it is actually really in some ways diminishing uh, the American nation and its standing in the world. So um, one of our discussions will hopefully make a very strong case for reform uh, of the American constitution. We also look at the, uh, the European Union and uh, the reform attempts or processes there. And the EU has got its very own sets of issues. I mean, it is quite different from the US in a sense that it is very much driven by national interests. Um, and, um, and it's a very different political environment uh, compared to the US. And of course, the kind of the shift to the right and the kind of the rediscovery and the rise of nationalism uh, in Europe, um, in France, in Italy, in Germany, you know, across, um, you know, like Poland, Hungary, and so on and so forth. Um, um, there, there's massive strain, of course, on on the EU uh, and, and a kind of a, an increasing difficulty to hold it all together. So uh, some people believe that a reform, of the European, uh, the European. Um, a settlement also is necessary to hold the EU together and to guarantee its 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 future. Um, finally, we look at, at Mali, a very very different case. Um, it's of course a highly fragile state, uh, and um, and the issues there are quite quite uh, different. Um, much more comparable in some ways, but not in others, uh, to uh, what happened in 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 Kenya, what I referred to earlier on. So we'll be talking about the scope for and possible impacts of constitutional reform within these specific contexts and share insights gained and lessons learned within one of the contexts to see whether they can be applied or shared uh, uh, useful uh, in other contexts. So with me today um, are John Davenport, who is professor of philosophy at Fordham University and the author of Saving American Democracy, the case for constitutional reform in the US. In fact, it was this book uh, and uh, sort of previous conversations I've had with John that kind of, you know, triggered uh, the idea over the kind of the, the impetus uh, for, for this roundtable to start with. So John, thank you very much for being with us today. 
Um, with me also is Ali al Haj Sleiman, and he is quite different from what the other two discussions because he comes very much from a practitioner's perspective, and that is so welcome. Um, Ali joins us from West Africa, um, uh, and um, we will um, learn more about his experiences there uh, in Mali with the, uh, the referendum and all the rest. Finally, uh, there is uh, Roberto Castaldi. He is another democracy school regular. He is based in Italy. He's Associate Professor of Political Philosophy at Ecampus University, and he's also General Editor of Euractive Italy. Now, Euractive, for uh, uh, those listeners who don't know of it, it's a pan-European news and media platform uh, with country chapters, if you like, and there's a Euractive Germany, Euractive France, and so forth. And of course, there's a Euractive Italy, and Roberto is the, the General Editor uh, for that. So um, I can see that my discussions are all here, so I will invite them straight in. Hello, John. Hi. Hello, Hello Roberto. Hello, everybody. Do you know, Ali, I expected a really grainy, fussy kind of like connection. Who would have thought that West Africa has got such brilliant broadband? I'm so glad that you're here today. Thank you for joining us. You are welcome. You are welcome. Actually, we have a very stable internet here in, in Mali. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us. Now, let's go straight in. We've quite, got quite an agenda and we've got very, very different perspectives on this whole concept of constitutional reform. Um, I said this already. Um, it was really a conversation with John, John Davenport, that kind of triggered this, this whole round table because he's been, he's been promoting his book, but more importantly, he's been sharing his ideas on, on the challenges the U.S. faces um uh, you know and and how and he's been really drilling down uh, in his research to kind of understand how these challenges might be related to the the constitutional settlement in the us in other words how structural factors uh, may actually may account to to quite a significant extent uh, uh, for the problems that the us is facing politically and i probably would add morally as well but i mean this is a, a sort of a, a separate debate and, and of course sean he's a he's an expert on, on 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 moral philosophy so so maybe you know that can sort of feed into the discussion as well Sean, let me dive straight in um in your latest book, you make a strong case for constitutional reform. Um, it's all about saving the American democracy. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, why does the US need a constitutional reform? I mean, you know, who, who's to say? Uh, and what kinds of changes do you have in mind? Now, try to keep this really quite short. If you can, I'll have a follow on question. Um, so but I'm really keen to understand what's the actual the core of your argument here? Well, I think the perception is uh, spreading very quickly and widely in the United States that things are deeply wrong. Although Americans have in the last 50 years, since our uh, last round of constitutional reforms in the 60s and 70s, they've grown quite wary of any talk of constitutional reform. They're no longer familiar with what that looks like. I think nevertheless, people are realizing, wow, we're in deep trouble. We're in a kind of downward spiral here. Uh, and in my view, when you do drill down into what the root causes of this sort of phenomenon are, you find problems with our legislature and with our elections. Uh, and, you know, they're really quite deep. Um, in the case of the legislature, it's, um, it's a number of factors put together. Um, the fact that we require this supermajority threshold in our upper chamber in the U.S. Senate uh, to pass almost anything um, is the filibuster, it's what we call it, right? The endless speaking or threatening to speak uh, to delay bills. When you combine this along with the presence of um, too many seats that are uh, safe, that are uh, designed or gerrymandered, uh, you know, um, uh, specifically tailor made in their boundaries to re elect incumbents, um, you get a party that uh, is on one extreme or the other and tending more and more that way. The system of primary elections here also reinforces that. Now, when you add into that um, false stories, conspiracy theories about election returns, um, the lack of any national standard, the fact that all 50 states can and do manipulate their voting systems uh, to try to give advantage to the party that controls the state government at the time of uh, legislative change there, you have almost a perfect storm. Um, when you in, in add in additionally a Supreme Court 
that's no, no longer willing to police those things, that won't enforce any longer the Voting Rights Act uh, that we passed in the 1960s, which was reaffirmed almost unanimously by the U.S. Congress, believe it or not, when George W. Bush was the president. Um, but now we, we have all of these factors kind of converging. Uh, too many people in the public don't believe the election returns aren't sure, um, and they're easily manipulated on that score. So we're in real trouble. Um, I don't want to take too much time, but I could point to a couple other factors um, uh, related to just the education of citizens. Uh, the fact that there isn't um, really any national standard in our educational system just to make sure that citizens know even the most fundamental basic things you would think that anyone has to know to make this system work. So we're in, yeah, we're in deep trouble, unfortunately. It's very sad to see. Okay, so, um, but um, of course this is a, you know, I mean, you, you know, one could argue, and I'm being sort of, the, sort of like, you know, like if you like the devil's advocate here, one could argue this is a distinctly Democrat uh, or democratic uh, point of view, uh, and it's a kind of, in a way, a partisan view on the mm. subject. Republicans would probably argue, oh, that's not entirely the case. Can you make a sort of a national interest argument around uh, your proposal um, that doesn't draw on a particular perspective, but that sort of looks at the, the impact the current situation has uh, on the United States democracy and also its standing in the world? Right. Well, if you just think about um, big, what I call real world problems, um, problems that do affect uh, ordinary people in their day to day lives uh, that you know have nothing to do directly with the intricacies of the workings in Congress uh, or the way that the different administrative bureaus try to enforce the laws or the Supreme Court pleases them. Uh, but rather, you know, just the fact that the national government really isn't able to do much anymore to address new problems as they come up. Um, I mean, Republicans are also affected by the wave of storms and, and heat uh, and, uh, and other weather-related crises that are impinging more and more uh, on people across this continent. Um, you know, this, uh, this last season has been extraordinary and looks set to continue in this direction. There are parts of the United States where um, homeowners are no longer going to be able to even buy insurance on their properties because the danger of wildfires, um, the danger of storms, uh, hurricanes wiping them out has grown just so large that insurance companies can no longer write this sort of coverage. Uh, now, what about um, rising income inequality? Uh, despite you know a, a few gains in, in the last couple of years, income inequality and even more wealth inequality continues to rise steeply in this country. Uh, more and more people feel like the system is rigged against them. Higher education has become unaffordable for probably half the country. Uh, there's no solution looming to the enormous overhang of student debt that we have. Uh, our medical system is still uh, incredibly lopsided um, despite all the efforts of President Obama uh, there's still millions of Americans without basic medical care. Uh, and this drags, of course, on the economic productivity of the nation when you have too many people sick or unable to get uh, preventative treatment, but only able to go to emergency rooms in a crisis. Um, we have the long-term problems of immigration that many Republicans care deeply about and that concerns, to be frank, you know, many centrist Democrats as well. Um, how are we to absorb so many people so quickly? Uh, a problem that Europe is obviously familiar with as well, um, and the the disturbances, the, uh, um, the the waves that this causes in uh, in political feelings across the continent. There are just so many of these problems. Uh, uh, Americans look to Congress, and here's the the, pro the 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 difficulty is they don't understand why Congress doesn't act on these issues. Okay, they know that maybe they wouldn't get everything they want, but why can't there be a compromise? bill or legislation. I mean, it took us over a decade just to get a bill like that to build new bridges and roads and upgrade our train system, So, which will take years to spend all the money appropriated for infrastructure. But that's an exception. I mean, e even to do that in, in, in 10, 20 years is, uh, is a rare thing now. Uh, people just don't understand that the system is now set up so that the two major parties 
have strong incentives to pretend that they want to do something um, and then to blame the other side that they couldn't do it. So in, in short, we're, we're suffering from the lack of a parliamentary system here. We, uh, you know, we, we have almost the opposite problems that you see in parliamentary systems like, well, the one that Spain finds itself in right now, right? How to form a coalition government. Uh, instead, we have two parties that um, would prefer uh, to pretend they want to do highly extreme things and then, you know, scream and kick and yell when they can't do them because they're blocked in the Congress. Um, if they actually could pass the legislation in their platforms, uh, well, they would have to, you know, put up or shut up, right? They would have to put their money where their mouth is, phrases the Americans love, uh, and do what they said they were going to do. Uh, I doubt in that situation that they would actually pass half or two thirds of the things they say they're for, uh, because then they'd have to live with the consequences of that legislation. And people in many cases would be very unhappy with that. So we have a system that incentivizes posturing without substance. Um, it's, it's a, you know, that, that's really, in my view, the core of the problem. Um, now you, you, you're suggesting a whole host of, uh, you know, anywhere, I don't know, is it 20, 25 amendments, specific amendments to the constitution. Um, now that's a, that's a, that's a, a long list and we won't have the time to go through all of these, but could you just give us the top three or the top five very quickly so that, that the viewers and listeners get an idea of what you're talking about? Yes. Um, well, uh, I think that the, the top five on my list have got to include uh, fixing the election system with national standards that are transparent and allow, make it easier for people to both register and to vote, but reassure Americans that there's not going to be widespread election fraud. Of course, there isn't such fraud, but many people believe that there is and have been kind of groomed or brainwashed into believing that. So that's probably problem number one. Otherwise, we're going to see, you know, our next elections get even worse than the last two. Um, that's very likely to happen next year here. But getting rid of the filibuster, that solves the posturing problem that I was, I was talking about, uh, opening up our primary elections so that uh, it isn't just um, the the least uh, the smallest fifth of the public that's controlling who really gets to represent them, um, making uh, elections for Congress more competitive by ending gerrymandering is also very high on the priority list. But after that, I would probably put um, the, uh, the the education that Americans need to understand the basics of their government, what we, here we tend to call civics education. Many states have such requirements, but they're very weak or, or, or sort of um, flimsy, if you like. There's not a lot of substance to them. We need a, a list spelled out. In particular, people have to understand what's the difference between goods that markets can deliver uh, and goods that only government or uh, sometimes some charitable organizations can be involved in delivering, so-called public goods, as the economists call them. We need people to understand just the basics of what public goods are, why government has a role at all, uh, and then how it is that the elections really work, uh, and the presence of dark money, uh, which I didn't mention earlier in our elections, has become such a huge problem. Um, just reversing that situation, restoring serious limits on um, campaign donations and independent election spending here. Uh, this is a problem that most European countries do not have. Um, but these these sort of reforms, I think, actually would be quite popular. Many Americans do believe that the federal government is corrupt. They don't really quite understand why or how this corruption is working. Uh, but they do grasp that lots of billionaires are pouring lots of money in one way or another into elections. And I think they're starting to realize that a small cabal has basically got a stranglehold on the Supreme Court. Um, so these sort of reforms, I don't think, are too hard to make popular with enough political leadership. But just to get this ball rolling is a big, you know, it's, it's, it's inertia. It's difficult to get it started. Absolutely. So it requires now, real leadership there. Now, now this leads me on to my, my, my last question. And we're already kind of sort of like almost in overtime, but I, 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 I want to kind sure. of follow, follow up on this. Um, you suggest setting up a, a constitutional convention. Now, that's an unusual way of going about it. Uh, not necessarily so mm. unusual, but I think within the U.S. system, it is an unusual proposal. Um, 
And could you say a little bit about that? What is the thinking behind that and, and how, how would it work? But try to do it in a minute or two so that, yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Very basically, it does two things. It avoids the roadblocks in Congress, which uh, all amendments, uh, all uh, 28 amendments that we've had uh, made over um, the time since the founding of this country have passed through Congress. You need two thirds of two chambers. That's just to get a proposal on to ratification to the, uh, to the states. Three quarters of the states then have to ratify. Um, the convention uh, replaces the first step in that process. Instead of Congress having to pass the amendment proposals, uh, a convention does it. That can be one chamber, one body, passing amendment proposals onto the states by a simple majority vote. So there you have two huge advantages right there. Uh, and third, imagine that the delegates to the assembly uh, or to the convention are not um, regular politicians or career politicians, uh, but rather ordinary people drawn from civic leadership across the country for this one special purpose, uh, bringing with them experts and advisors as needed. This would be a little bit like the, the big citizen jury process that Iceland set up. Uh, if you're familiar with that, you might have even done a previous episode on the, I know you're uh, very interested in these kinds of processes. So something like that is what we need here, um, where people can feel like the delegates they've elected to a convention from their home state, um, you know, really are in this to solve problems and to make a historic contribution um, rather than, again, just to go on to some kind of uh, uh, other career. Um, uh, and so everything depends, in my view, on setting up a convention in such a way that there's a kind of maximum incentive for the delegates um, to get something done uh, with the recognition that um, the weight of history is upon them in a way that it almost never is for a vote in Congress. Uh, you know, like our founders, they'll be remembered for hundreds of years for everything they said and did in that convention. Um, and if they produce nothing, they'll be viewed as the biggest failures in American history. Excellent. That's why I think this process will work. Excellent. John, we come back to this. And it's actually really interesting because Ali actually is an elections expert. So I think uh, he's probably been taking a few notes already uh, in terms of his thinking about you know, how to make an election work and fair and transparent and so forth. We'll come to that in the discussion later. But uh, let, let me let me move on. Uh, uh, um, there was a constitutional reform uh, was held in Mali just very recently. Uh, sorry, a constitutional referendum was held in Mali just very recently on the 18th of June. Um, well, this has been a long time in the making. Originally, it was uh, uh, scheduled for 2017, but it was then postponed uh, at the last minute with no set date before it was revived in April 2021 with a set date for October uh, uh, 2021. Uh, however, due to the 2021 uh, malign coup d'etat, um, it was postponed again and again until eventually it went ahead about a month ago. So this has been a really drawn out, uh, quite a difficult birth, if you like. Um, and, and, and Ali uh, has been uh, there uh, part of that time um, he's been uh, involved in the preparation for this referendum. So, Ali, um, let me ask you this. What is the, the background to this um, from a sort of inside perspective? What was, why, why was a new constitution deemed necessary? I need to unmute my phone. Actually, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, actually, this is a long process, as you said. And it's not since like 2017. It's actually uh, the problem, the problem of uh, uh, power in Mali, if we can say, the power, the authorities in Mali is a long time ago. It's since 1960, we have this this conflict conflict of power of like who's like who's will lead, why he will lead, and how he will lead. So this constitution was like so long time. A demand, uh, and then they have it. To the, uh, 1992, they have the, the the last the last reform, the last constitution, the last uh, referendum was a constitution. They try to do this, and we have they have coup d'état. Actually, this is a, this is one of the major facts that the 
changing because of this uh, uh, blocking of, of uh, transition, democratic transition. So we have, we face lots of coup d'etat that lead to delay and delay and delay in the process. 2017 was supposed to be like a, refer a referendum or uh, everything was settled to have a referendum. And then later on, we get to this point after we have a coup d'etat and then after coup d'etat, we have another coup d'etat. So it's like, of history of of uh, of coup d'état that is not allowed people to 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 go to express themselves, and we need to also to take the aspect of of the country. It's like it's not only about democracy and what is, it's about culture and about history of this of this of this country. So what's work in United States that, that doesn't work in Mali? What's work in in Germany doesn't work in Mali? It's like different point of view and then and democracy is not democracy is not one aspect in in in, in if you can like you can make it general so yes first of all if i want to say in the past two years after the first coup d'etat until now we have the political dialogue that is was like one little bit like one major one main major of of, of this like delay then we have uh, because the political party we need we need to agree also that the political party here is not well established as in the other countries so like the political parties in mali we don't have like real uh, ideological political parties that they can lead or they can take the lead on this process so it's like with uh, we are relayed more on some some personalities that are like trying to do this after the the after the pass of of of, uh, of uh, Sumaila Sisi, and one of the politicians here in Mali, we don't have really someone who can take care of the political aspect in, in, in the country or to take care about a political dialogue in in in, uh, in in this in this country. So because of this, we have this delay. Then we have the sanction that's uh, set out, and actually, yeah, when when you are when you are admit or when you recognize a coup d'etat, you need to, to recognize also their authorities and you need to recognize their time frame. You cannot recognize one aspect and let the other like. So this is this is also of, of understanding. So they want a coup d'etat, they, they recognize coup d'etat, but they, they don't recognize what will happen after a coup d'etat. And that is like one aspect to lead to this like misunderstanding about a transition. So. The transition here is not really is not completely, but you know, at the end we had a referendum. Probably is not the best constitution in the world. Probably if this constitution is somewhere somewhere else, it will be the worst. I will not judge it uh, as a good or bad, but at least now we can say that we have a social contract between Mali, and this is one who will lead also later on for amending this constitution. This is the first step. You can let amend me, that. Let, let me interrupt here for one second. Um, when we spoke before, um, uh, not too long ago, I what I was really fascinated by was the diversity of that country. Exactly. I, think, I think, you know, listeners and viewers probably aren't aware of this. Yes. When, they, when, they, when they think yes. Mali, yes. they probably think a homogenous population, exactly. but it's not at all. We have we have here 18 national language in this country. We have 18 national language to bring 18 diversity <laughs> to one table, sit to one table to discuss. Probably they will they will uh, the, the first the first thing they were thinking about is not democracy, is not who will take the power, is not is a parliamentary system or like a presidential system. It was a, the discussion was what will be the national language, the official language of the country, because Absolutely. it's their identity. And of course, we behind, I'd imagine behind those languages would be tribal traditions. The identity, no? no, no, it's the identity of the people. The, the, their language is their identity. They are like they now officially now in Mali that the French is the official language. Okay, but they, they they don't consider it as their national language. So now it's like the, the, the all the discussion before the the, the 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 referendum. It was about what we want as a national language. 
what will be our national language? It will be the Bambara, it will be the Tamachek, it will be the Arab, it will, it will, exactly. And that is like the big question because behind this question is the identity of all this diversity. So when I said, this is a first step, this, this constitution is not the last step. Because we are not, I'm, I'm not talking about well-established country at Germany, United States, whatever. I'm talking about a third world developed country like, like Mali, who's like now in the, in the beginning of their process, hopefully. At the end, I, I hope, anyway, at the end is, is, is not in our hand. But actually to hold, to have a social contract between this 18 diversity on some aspect that lead also to mitigate violence between different entities, like it's, 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 it's something good. So it's, later on, yeah, later it's, on, no, it's, sorry, it's a on. process. And this is it's a process because now we have, as they have so much difficulties, difficulties of poverty, difficulties of like now terrorism, they have like insecurity, country is divided in two, you have lots of, of uh, they have lack of infrastructure. Uh, you have lots of things that, that you need to deal with. This transition, this transition will not stop even after a, a elected government. This transition need to be part of uh, of ages and ages. So probably I, I would not be surprised if after five years we need to do an amendment on, on, on this constitution to go to another. Because usually, and I, I agree that all the constitutions, at some point, they need to be amended. One constitution is like who like who get written in, in, in 1918, probably is not suitable to like 2023. Like, Absolutely. Ali, let me let me just ask a, a sort of a follow on question here. Um, I, I mean, in, I mean, the government in Mali is, of course, it's not very strong. Uh, and I would imagine that outside of urban centers, it is probably close to non-existent. Uh, so, so how do we have to p visualize this constitutional uh, process? Who, who were the different stakeholders and how were they brought together? What, what was the actual, uh, the, the structure? And actually, for actually, it's like, okay, actually at that time, we don't have this like uh, we 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 have like uh, the, with the assistance of the Minusma, the assistance of the Burkan and Tokiba, the, the most of the country was secured, so the terrorists wasn't hold, they wasn't have a strong hold somewhere where we cannot go. So even in Tombuktu, I visit Tombuktu, Tombuktu, I can go there. Probably I can go to the Tombuktu region, the city, the capital of the region, but I cannot go to the to the other to the other like area urban area, like okay. But you know, at least I can reach somewhere. So they hold like. Assise Nationale de la Fondation, they hold like public consultation. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect. At the end, we cannot ask some perfection from, from, from anyone, but at least we have some point of view. What's happened, what's make me, what, what, what let me make the statement that till now, after like on the we have the on the 18th there was the the referendum. After five days we have the primary uh, results, and then we have the results like uh, almost one week ago. We don't have appeal against the results as a result. Pro probably we have appeal in the court uh, in the court constitutional uh, against some uh, logistical, technical something like this, but we don't have. A real like disagreement about about this constitution. I, like we we don't have like major major uh, things. Uh, at the end, uh, I, I I I know this is like probably if I'm holding this election in the same co in, in the same uh, aspect in the other country, it will not be transparent. But this is the culture here. So the culture here, when we are talking about tribal culture, when we're talking about tribal leader culture, when we're talking about all this, we need to take this in aspect. So like secrecy of voice, I know I know that in the, in the tribes, they, they don't respect the secrecy of, of vote. So they, they, they like, even they nominate the tribal leader to go to vote for them. So I cannot tell people, no, you cannot nominate someone to vote for you. So, so. Now, um, my, understanding is, my understanding is, I mean, in, in most of these processes, there's some carrots and some sticks. There are incentives and there are penalties. Um, now, um, from my understanding is that Mali found itself in the situation where the vast majority of NGOs and international developed organizations and aid organizations 
had left the country and were essentially saying, look, guys, unless you kind of get your act together and presumably have a, a constitutional reform process, we can't really be coming back to Mali. Um, and, and so my question is, is having, having gone through this process, do you get a sense that the international uh, community, uh, NGOs and so forth, are respecting that process? Absolutely. Or is there still big question marks? Actually, uh, what can I say? Like, not all the NGOs or international NGOs left Mali. We have lots of NGOs stayed here. In the first, in the beginning, it was uh, French affiliated NGOs. So NGOs with fund with the French funding. And since then, like they're asking all the NGO about their source of funding uh, because they have this political problem with the French since since long time. It's not it's not in, in new in the history. And then we have this problem with uh, Minusma, and this is concerned only. The peacekeeping mission is not concerning all the other uh, agency of UN because I know that because we had we we, we had like a close co conversation with all the actors here that we I know that most of the uh, logistic or humanitarian work that Minusma was taking care of now is like is handled to the other NGO like WFP uh, UNDP WHO and the others so. For sure, the 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 withdrawal of, of Minusma in, in the county will will create a great gap. That I don't know if the government could fill this this gap on security first of all, and we have we have an economic uh, situation that will created by departure of twelve thousand soldiers from 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 from, from 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 the country so and then we have we have before the 5000 of Burkan and 3000 of Tokyo so like we are talking about around 20000 soldiers who left who will who will be leaving Mali so yes it will be have an impact on the security what's the disposition uh, there was a position of the government in this moment the government says they are ready to do this but i don't know i don't really i cannot i have some some doubt but I cannot question their their ability because I'm not close to the to the, to the security sector. So, like, hopefully, they are will be well equipped or they will have some assistance to do this. I have, uh, till now we don't know. We are waiting to see the situation on the ground. We are we are we still have like six months to to observe the the impact of the Minusma withdrawal from the country. But yes, I think. And then we will have now we, we it's like if we are going to the to the chronogram to the election chronogram we will we need to have like local election it's like very hardly to be happen probably we'll go directly to the presidential election in two thousand in two thousand twenty four February to two thousand twenty four probably at that time we have some sort of uh, stability. Excellent. Well, I mean, let's let's pause it here for a moment. I mean, what we've seen is 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 the the the, the stark contrast. Uh, between what's you know like your situation in Mali and what it means to 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 reform a, or to, you know write a constitution compared to the, the situation that John faces in the U.S., which is fundamentally different. But I kind of we will come back to this later to see whether there are some fundamental truths and fundamental insights that might not still apply across. We we come to that. But let's move on um, to um, to our third speaker. Uh, uh, Roberto, uh, Roberto, the, the conference uh, on the future of Europe was a citizen-led series of debates and discussions that ran from April 21 to May 22 uh, to enable people from across the opinion to share ideas and help shape the EU's future. Although not officially billed as such, many observers saw this initiative as a first step in a constitutional reform process that some hoped, and I think you may well be in that group, uh, would ultimately culminate in the creation of a fully fledged federal or supranational democracy. Roberto, you've been closely involved uh, with this uh, conference and you've been following it uh, uh, ever since. Tell me, what were the core demands or recommendations coming out of the conference on the future of Europe? And leading on from that, um, what has happened since? Is this gathering momentum or is this being kicked into the long grass? In other words, is this kind of being bogged down by all kinds of uh, you know, maneuvers? Um, over to you, Roberto. Well, basically the conference started very late uh, due to the pandemic and initially started very slowly. 
But because of the pandemic and the European Union answer to the pandemic with the next uh, uh, generation EU, the first time that we had European debt to have a solidarity and recovery plan, uh, and because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this took momentum at the end. And basically what the European citizens asked were three things. First, to increase the competencies of the European Union, because with these events, they realize that the European Union, very often we have the debate in which we say the European Union should do this or should do that. And then people realize, yes, but health is not a competence of the European Union, it's a national competence. Foreign and defense policy, the European Union should do this and that, but this is a national competence as well. So the first thing was a request to increase the competence of the European Union. The second was to increase the powers of the European Union, because very often in the past we have a, a transfer of competence that was not matched by any transfer of power. For example, with the Maastricht Treaty, we created the common foreign and security policy. The only problem is that we did not create any institution, any power, any decision-making system to, create, to really have a European foreign security policy. So there is this uh, uh, title, but the first things that happened was the Yugoslavian war and each European country went its own way, those that were for Serbia, those for Croatia, those for Slovenia, and so on. So uh, to increase the competence, to increase the power, and third, to increase the democracy. Because people realize that one of the reasons why sometimes we have competencies, but we don't have power is, is on those competencies in which we have kept unanimity as the decision-making rule. So there are competencies in which the European Union theoretically can take a decision, but only if all the 27 member states government agree. So if there is just one government, let's say Luxembourg or Cyprus, so a very a, a small uh, uh, country, that's, let's say Luxembourg has 300,000 inhabitants out of uh, half a, a billion uh, inhabitants of the European Union, it's enough to prevent any decision. And this is not an hypothetical issue because for decades, for instance, Luxembourg is a fiscal paradise and there's block all kind of legislation against fiscal paradise. Mm. So there were 300,000 people that were preventing a decision by 450 millions. So this was a key uh, uh, request, get rid of unanimity strengthen European democracy, which means on the one hand, uh, strengthen the power of the European Parliament, which is the only directly elected uh, institution vis-a-vis -vis the intergovernmental institution where the member states government uh, sit, strengthen the European Commission role as the parliamentary government uh, of the European Union, and get rid of unanimity. This was uh, a main uh, request because essentially the European Union is a, a, a strange beast because on certain because usually a state works in the same way across all competencies. The specificity of the EU is that on different competencies it works in different way. So if we think about uh, the monetary union, this is a, works uh, like a federal system. We have a European Central Bank that takes decision by majority, and that's it. On many economic issues like the single market, we have a federal system because we, decisions are taken by co-decision between the European Parliament, which represents the citizen, and the Council of the EU, which represents the member state deciding by qualified majority, which means 55% of the member states that represents at least 65% of the European Union population. So in this case, it works very much as a federal system. But on foreign and security policy, on defense, on all fiscal issues, here we have unanimity and the decisions are focused on the member states alone in the council, where it's very difficult to get unanimity. We also uh, got rid of the old American uh, motto that started the revolution, not taxation without representation. In Europe, we have to fight for no representation without taxation. Because we have a European Parliament, but it cannot decide about taxes. European Parliament can decide about European Union expenditures, but it cannot decide about European Union revenue. 
these are decisions that is only up to the council, which means to the member states uh, deciding by unanimity, which is utterly undemocratic. So while the American had to fight for no taxation without representation, now we have to fight for no representation without taxation, which, is, which may seem a paradox, but it's not. And uh, just as we spoke about Mali, but we can speak about issue about democracy and constitution also elsewhere. Uh, one of the reasons why in some Arab countries, the ruler, uh, they say that we don't need democracy is because they don't tax people. They say there is no taxation, so there need be no representation. Now, so the, this issue is still very much alive even people think it's uh, all gone. And it's getting momentum because the member states uh, didn't want any of this and didn't do anything about it. But the European Parliament has taken upon itself uh, the task to transform all these uh, proposals into a comprehensive treaty reform proposal. At first, uh, they made uh, two proposals uh, that were changing two articles of the treaty to get rid of unanimity. And on this basis, they asked the council, that is the member states government, to open a constitutional convention. The council said, but you mentioned also all the other proposals. So first prepare all the proposals to reform, and then we will decide if they require a constitutional convention. So the European Parliament is now working for one year on this constitutional reform proposal. The rapporteur of all the main groups, parliamentary groups have agreed on the text, which should be voted very soon by the Constitutional Affairs Committee and be approved by the plenary of the Parliament next October. So if this happens next October, the Parliament will approve a comprehensive treaty reform proposal, which would be like a comprehensive constitutional reform. And on that basis, uh, the, the treaty provides that the European Council, which is the meeting of the head of states and government of the member state, can decide by simple majority to open a constitutional convention to decide on the reform. So it's getting momentum in the sense that the European Parliament is working on this. There are lots of resistance by the member states because they don't want to get rid of unanimity. They don't want to increase the power of the uh, union or if you want of the federal level of the union is already a multi-level system of government. Only that it works as a democratic one on certain competencies and it doesn't on other competencies. So when we are speaking about reforming the union basically is about uh, federalizing those competencies that today are only intergovernmental. Excellent. This was a really a very sharp and a very succinct uh, sort of summary of, 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 of where we are. Thank you very, very much, Roberto. Um, now, um, the, the, of course, it, it's, it, it's an interesting and it also shows, shows to some extent the kind of impotence of the European Parliament, doesn't it? Because, of course, where does it go from there? I mean, the European Parliament can develop those proposals um, and it can put it to the Council, but if it's basically rejected, then what then? Well, I think it's very unlikely that the Council will uh, refuse to start uh, our reform uh, procedure. First, because it would not only be a kick in the face uh, to the European Parliament, which is the only directly elected institution, but also to the whole exercise of the Conference on the Future of Europe, which was uh, presented as the first experiment in participatory democracy by the European Union. Okay. They've asked a number of proposals. The parliament has turned them into formal uh, amendment proposal. And then you say, okay, we don't give a damn about democracy. I don't think this is uh, politically feasible. And uh, I think that so that the, 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 the reform will, uh, pro uh, process will start. The problem is a different one. It is easy to start a reform proposal. It is very difficult to finish it because the Treaty of the European Union currently provides that uh, any uh, reform needs to be agreed unanimously by all the member states' government and ratified unanimously by all the 27 member states. This is extremely difficult for a very simple reason. Some countries will have referendum and referendum at national level usually don't give a damn about what is the question but they only care about trying to the opposition to get down the government, because if the government lose the election or referendum, they manage to get rid of the government. So 
one of the most interesting proposal of the conference we still have to see if this will be part of the text of the European Parliament, was to create a European Union referendum. So the, the citizen asked to have a participatory democracy in the sense of having a European referendum. Now, if my belief is, is, is that if a European referendum is created as an institution, then the most important case in which this should be used should be to ratify constitutional amendments. Because the, when you should ask European citizens as such to express themselves, if not on their own constitutional arrangement. So my uh, uh, hope is that the constitutional reform will include the European referendum and provide that this is used for the ratification of the reform itself through a final and provisional uh, clause which by the way is what happened in all transformation of confederal system into federal system. Because the articles of confederation in the United States provide for a unanimous uh, uh, ratification for reform, but the Philadelphia Convention wrote a brand new constitution that provides for qualified majority for uh, ratification. In Canada, in, in, uh, in Australia and in Switzerland, the same thing happened. So all the time that a confederal system turned federal was through a constitutional reform that include a final and provisional clause about its own ratification that get rid of unanimity. I think this is what we need, that the European referendum is the most suitable tool because it is the most democratic one, but that we need to do something more. A European referendum that has a double majority provision because uh, in the European Union, you have small member states, you have big member states and so on. So I think that we need to have both a European majority of citizens, but you know also need to have national majority in a majority of member states, because you cannot make a constitution that say all the power is related to population. You have the five largest states that vote for the constitution because they give them all the power and uh, all the small states are done. At the same time, it cannot be like now that each state counts equal because you have Luxembourg with 300,000 and Germany with 90 million. So if we have a referendum with a double majority, I think this uh, it would reflect the federal nature of the union as a union of citizens and of states. And the second element uh, in my view for uh, uh, regarding the referendum for constitutional reform uh, ratification, we to have uh, a two rounds referendum because you have a constitutional reform, you have a referendum, let's say you have a European majority and a national majority in a majority of member states. But let's say that in three member states, you don't have a majority. In this case, they should be given the chance to vote again within six months to decide if they want to leave the union, which is possible through article 50, or if they want to ratify. This way, they can make a reasonable choice if they really don't like the new constitution, nobody is uh, obliging any member states to remain in a prison. The United European Union is a union of citizens and states, so they can quit the union. Or they may decide that they prefer to accept the constitution rather than to quit the European Union. So I think that this would be the most important uh, inno institutional innovation if we manage to get it uh, uh, done, because this would create uh, a feasible constitutional process that would allow to reform even the new constitution further in the future if needed. While now we are unable to make any reform because of the double unanimity about deciding on the reform and then on the ratification of the reform. Um, now, um, th there's one, if you like, um, <clears throat> sort of, um, I wouldn't call it alternative, but a sort of one kind of solution that, that was used with the euro and and um uh, and that is to sort of say well um you join eventually but you don't have to be part of the euro zone uh, from the beginning so i mean you could imagine a situation where sort of say there's a kind of a fast track uh, of of countries within the eu that wants to if you like a, a federate uh, further and the others stay out uh, for now and they don't participate um is, is that a sort of an option that you see as a possibility Absolutely, but we, everything has been done this way, with a vanguard. The first European colony steel community was a vanguard to the Council of Europe. 
the European election initially were unilateral. It was because some member states, uh, uh, the UK and uh, Denmark, uh, uh, were uh, uh, or Ireland, uh, you know, one of the two, uh, were, didn't agree with the direct election of the European Parliament. So they were scheduled for 1978, decided in 1974 for schedule for 1978. But then those governments decided that they could not politically be the only one that would not let their citizen elect their MEPs. <laughs> so they decided to join, and the election were postponed to 79. The euro, the Schengen area, these were all vanguards. There is an issue. Vanguards are possible regarding new competencies. You decide to create a new policy, somebody will decide to, step, to stay out. That's possible. It's not possible on institutions, because if you decide that this uh, competency is decided by qualified majority voting, you cannot decide, no, I want unanimity, I stay. So the, the, the problem is, this is possible when we are doing a step forward in terms of new policy area then you can have a vanguard and the other join later. But when you are reforming the institution, then either you stay, you are in or you are out. But the European Union has already invented a number of instruments to deal with this complexity. For instance, there are countries that are part of the single market, but are not part of the European Union. Norway, we have the European Economic Area, which is a treaty between European Union and other countries that want to be part of the single market, but don't want to be part of the European Union. So they are fully integrated in the economic part, but they do not take part in the institution in other policy. Just like there are other agreements with countries like Turkey, which is part of the uh, 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 custom union, for example, or now the new agreement with uh, uh, the UK after Brexit uh, or, and so on. So there are a number of possibilities to remain uh, somehow integrated with the European Union, even without being a fully fledged uh, member. But of course, uh, this is uh, remaining a member without participating in a policy is also possible, opt out uh, and so on, provide that they accept the institutional uh, framework. For the institution, and this was the problem with the UK ultimately. They don't accept the uh, basic principle of the union that was sharing and pooling of sovereignty. It was uh, a multi level system of government. The British, where uh, uh, public opinion uh, was never told the truth. Even if we look even at, at an academic level, if we look at the most important. Uh, British journal about European integration. Historically, the first one was the Journal of Common Market Studies. They didn't dare to call it with its name, the European Economic Community Studies, because community would give the idea that this is a political enterprise and project. So they call it the Journal of Common Market Studies, because in the UK, the name that was used in the public, in the media, by the politician to describe the European economic community was only the common market. They were never told the truth. And eventually, you pay with the Brexit because you cannot cheat the citizen for decades, telling them this is only an economic project, there is no political issue, when this is clearly a political issue. The start of the integration process was the Schuman Declaration, which said that the first Coal and steel community was supposed to be the first step towards a European federation. That was the very original goal from the very, very beginning. So now this is the issue. We have already created a federal system regarding the single market and the monetary union. And we have an intergovernmental system on the other competency. We have to decide. Now, let me finish with, uh, uh, if you like, uh, uh, a slogan. It's uh, always said that the European Union is an economic giant, a political dwarf, and a military world. But what does this really mean? This means that the Union is strong and the member states are weak. Because where we have pool and share sovereignty, economics, the European Union is a giant, an economic giant. Where we have kept sovereignty at national level, foreign security and defense policy, we are dwarf and warm. And that's what the European citizens are realizing. Because with the Ukraine, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, people realize that the European Union member states together spend almost three times more than Russia for defense. 
with no deterrence capacity whatsoever. Why? Because they have 27 useless military rather than having one. And I mean, this is there to see for everybody for the first time. So people are realizing that keeping sovereignty at national level on this issue means to be powerless at the international level. So this is creating momentum for more integration. And the pandemic has shown that without the European Union, we would have been, we would have had a level of death much higher. Without the European Union centralizing the financing and buying of vaccines and rolling out vaccine to all countries, rich and poor at the same level, at the same way, at the same time, we would have had the astonishing death rates and differences between rich country and poor country. And people realize this. So there is momentum because public opinion now, if you look at Eurobarometer, saying we need more euro. And this Excellent. is the first time for a long time. I think that's a very, very good point to sort of to, 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 to draw a line for now. Um, it's interesting because, of course, it's, it's, there is this kind of question about, um, is it about, you know, like sort of very often when people think about sort of constitutional reform, are we talking about writing a new constitution or are we talking about reforming an existing one? Now, it's a, if it's a reforming an existing one, which I think is very much what, what John is talking about and ultimately what, what you're talking about as well, it's kind of almost like fixing an engine like whilst it's running. And that, of course, is, is quite a quite a difficult thing to do. Now, uh, we all know this kind of saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and, and of course, I think that must go for constitutions as well. But how do we know whether something is broke? And I think, you know, in, in all three cases today, we've seen that there's a strong case uh, for, for fixing it. But, um, but who is to tell uh, whether something is broke? I mean, who's got the, the legitimacy? Is it we, the people? Is it the, the, the government? Is it, it's, it's a key question. Who's to tell whether something is broke? And what would fixing it entail? Um, well, you know, while John's proposal for the US, Mali's constitutional reform process and the EU's ongoing reform effort, they each tell their own story. Are there any lessons that can be shared, any insights gained in one context that might be helpful in advancing reform efforts in uh, another? Let me open up the discussion at this point and return to John uh, because yeah, because that's where we sort of started, and I've seen him take a few notes along the way. John, what's your thinking on this? Lots of notes. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, I um, I think that comparisons between all these three areas, uh, especially when looking at American history, the change, very fundamental one that we made uh, in the late 1780s to you know consolidate many of the powers of government into one federal union, um, it, it really is analogous to the sorts of problems uh, that Europe has. In, in my work, I've tried to design, I mean, it's very general or abstract, but I've tried to design what I think are a set of uh, criteria. I mean, they're drawn from the Federalist Papers that it's when you have um, national public goods, or in the case of the EU, you know, goods that range over a number of countries uh, in, in Europe, um, that can't be achieved without some kind of consolidated decision making and enforcement powers. Uh, that's when you have a case, you know, to expand those decision making and enforcement powers. And that's exactly what Roberta has been talking what uh, talking about um, uh, in the case of the EU. So you can use that as a kind of criterion, but you know, for citizens to understand it, they have to be educated about what public goods are and why some have different scopes and. Uh, why some, in some cases, they're needed to correct free rider problems and not in other cases. So, uh, sorry, this is getting a bit theoretical, but uh, if we take, for example, uh, you know, the cases where, as uh, Roberts was describing, we have um, a partial participation like the, um, uh, the Economic Union um, and, uh, and the Schengen area and so on, these work, that works because um, these are cases where a country that chooses not to participate isn't free riding too much on the other countries, right? Uh, but to the extent that it does, like, um, say, Luxembourg on fiscal and tax policies, uh, well, then, yeah, you get all the benefits of, uh, of, of EU protection and um, uh, being part of the economic system, but without paying, you know, the same costs, right, while, while enabling your 
your country to operate as a tax haven. So in those cases, the the, the case for you know strengthening the the federal power um, to compel member nations not to do that, not to free ride, uh, becomes I think overwhelming. Um, uh, if I may say, you know, then I'll, I'll yield to 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 one of the other. I had something to say about Mali as well. It's interesting how. Um, some of the elements in the new Mali constitution, which I guess has actually been adopted, and as we, as Ali was saying, we'll see how it goes. It's interesting how um, how many of them are similar to things <laughs> in my proposals for the United States. You would have think we would have got here a long time ago, but um, things just like um, uh, the um, uh, the requirement that members of the legislature disclose financial assets, right? Uh, uh, term limits on Supreme Court justices, um, you know, some limit on the president's control over who is on the Supreme Court. There, there are a number of just kind of very commonsensical uh, things in the new Mali Constitution that uh, uh, really, yeah, would be interesting for Americans to read about this. I might have to try to write something up on this. Um, but in the case of the EU, and I'll stop, I, I would say that what's ultimately made the U.S. federal system work up until now, where we're, you know, we are really entering the crisis phase, is um, uh, that single nationalized power, uh, you know, of the armed forces uh, and military policy. And if I could just wave a magic wand and, you know, allow Europe to uh, to have one, you know, new federal power, it would be that, right? I, I feel like. Yeah, in the face of the ongoing uh, crisis in Ukraine and the you know growing, it seems likely to continue to grow the challenge from Russia. Uh, that pushing that one reform forward, I assume that European nations wouldn't easily give up their own national militaries right away. But if one could also create uh, a Europe-wide military, right, with with assets that are. I guess directly at the you know at, at the disp disposure or you know at the control of the of the uh, EU Council or a military secretariat, as was the original hope with the UN actually, um, that would really work wonders. That you would you would have not just the forces that has to be cobbled together you know ad hoc when there's a particular crisis from different European countries where you're going to have that free rider problem, but every country contributes you know, a certain portion of this military proportional to its population and its economic means. And that means, you know, helicopters, aircraft carriers, of which Europe needs more, you know, uh, planes and so on, right? It, it's got to be sharing of personnel. And you could probably get a lot of this done by on a volunteer basis. That, to me, would really strengthen Europe. Well, I would like to bring in Roberto once more at this point, because we've had this discussion about a year ago, Roberto, and I, you know, your idea is still stuck in my mind. I, I just, I, you, you, you elaborate on it, just want to say what, 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 what I'm referring to. Um, you have two powers within the EU that are particularly if you like, they should be at the forefront of making this possible. That's Germany on the one hand and France on the other. Now, I, I, I explain why I say Germany and France. Germany is clearly the, the kind of economic powerhouse in Europe and has got the money. Now, France has got some money too, but what they really do have is a seat in the Security Council and nuclear arms. They are now the only nuclear power within the EU after the, the UK has left. Now, at this point, I hand over to you, Roberto, because you have developed a really interesting idea here how that, how that should work. Well, the, just like the Monetary Union was ultimately the Europeanization of the Deutschmark in exchange for European acceptance of the German unification, to have a political union, we need to Europeanize the, the UN, uh, French seat, uh, and uh, nuclear force de frappe. So the obstacle for political union, essentially, is France. The decision is uh, up, up to France. But of course, uh, this can be done uh, step by step, uh, just like the monetary union had three steps. Uh, and uh, if we think about uh, European defense, uh, we should think uh, about the original American military, not the current American military, which had a very small federal army and very strong national militias. But uh, it had West Point, so all uh, the training of all the cadres, both for the national militias and the federal army, were done together so that uh, when uh, 
the federal army needed to call on the national militia, they would have the same strategic thinking, same uh, weapon system, and so on and so forth. So we don't need to create a, a huge uh, uh, European army. Uh, we need to create a, a control and command center, a training center, a rep rapid reaction force, uh, which is permanently European, and then able to coordinate uh, the national military as we have now. And I think that to do that, to, uh, and to have the public opinion support to do that, we should also commit uh, that let's say we create uh, a 100,000 uh, rapid reaction force and we put 20,000 of these permanently at the disposal of the UN Secretary General with a unilateral application of the Charter of the UN, which was never applied, Chapter 7. And bringing the challenge to the US, China, and the other uh, members of the Security Council to do the same. At this point, this becomes clear that the European defense is not offense. I, mean, I think, I think, I think, and, uh, Robert, what part, part of, the of a model. Yeah, I think part of the problem, and you pointed this out in our previous conversation, is is that uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz was kind of fashioning this term Zeitenwende. That means epochal change, and what that means is that Germany is now going from a, and, and a, like a, a really kind of a minimal uh, sort of defense spending uh, to a much more adequate level of defense spending, and that in practice means that they have set aside a hundred billion. Um, to ex an extra 100 billion on top of the kind of ongoing defense spending to make up for shortfalls and to, as a catch up kind of thing. Now, I think, Roberto, when we spoke previously, you kind of analytically put your finger on this quite well. You know, if Germany and other countries now at this point spent such significant sums on their own military, then we're locking ourselves into another 50 years of national defense. Uh, what should happen at this point is that these large sums are being spent in a much more coordinated fashion. Isn't that what you were saying? Yes, yes. The, the, but the issue is that to do that, we need a French decision. Because the point is, if France, the German, may be willing to uh, use, uh, and in fact, they did. I mean, the, the German government said that part of those uh, money could be used, for instance, for uh, the French nuclear deterrence if this was Europeanized. The point is that the France government didn't give any reply. So, the, the, but the, this is a short uh, uh, term vision by France because France today is the largest military power in Europe. But if Germany decides to invest 2% of GDP really in uh, its military, plus uh, 100 billion uh, una tantum or every a few years, then it can catch up quite quickly. And at that point, uh, it will not be France to be the guide and the leader of the new European defense. Why, if they do it now, France will be the leading country. Um, one of the, my idea in a technical point perspective is that the only way to do that uh, is uh, we need to overcome American hostility. Because the United States, I always say, they are very much in favor of European uh, uh, defense integration provide it does not create any form of duplication compared to NATO. Now, this means that you cannot create a command and control center because you have already have one in NATO, uh, which is what we need to create a European defense. So my view is that we only have one chance to Europeanize the Eurocorp. The Eurocorp uh, was the development of the initial Franco-German brigade. And now there are also the Netherlands, Spain, Poland, other countries inside the Eurocorp, which essentially is a command and control center based in Strasbourg. So if we Europeanize that, we are not duplicating it. We are taking something that already exists, but rather than being uh, small things between a few countries, we, it become, it's Europeanized, for example, for the permanent structure cooperation on defense, which is a tool of the treaty. At that point, uh, we can create uh, a European defense uh, as part of a European pillar of NATO. Because of course, NATO will uh, remain the main pillar of European security. The problem is uh, that in order to go ahead, basically we need uh, to be afraid of somebody. Now, Vladimir Putin is helping Europeans to decide that we need some more uh, defense integration. And for the first time, we use European Union budget for military, for buying uh, ammunition to provide help to Ukraine and so on. 
the other uh, person in the past who helped uh, move the first step to our European integration was, of course, uh, Donald Trump uh, when he was president. It was under his presidency we started the first permanent structural cooperation, not by chance, because he said that the Baltic countries' independence was not his business. Now, if uh, Donald Trump uh, was, uh, is going to be reelected, this would be a disaster for American democracy and would be a great boost for European defense integration. I think that's a good point to bring Ali on, uh, in once more. Ali, I mean, you're sort of sitting in West Africa and you're, you're listening to this kind of conversation between sort of an American and a European perspective. What's going through your mind whilst you're listening to all of this? Well, uh, first of all, okay, thank God I'm not there. <laughs> second, second thing is like we have, we have a huge, uh, you know, like, this is, we cannot compare the two, the, the, the three together. Probably, like we have probably a little bit of comparison between United States and Europe, but Africa is like, like we are way, we have like a huge way at least to reach uh, some of this discussion. Danny. The discussion here is on the primary things. So, so we, are, we are discussing here food, security, housing, whatever. For uh, for union and for like uh, an established well established countries as United States that like they have like lots more of of, of privilege to discuss let's more it's, it's not a privilege it's a rights but for for the margin here if I'm what I, I want to take into consideration the margin here they are like thinking about their own food and, and security before thinking about all this like contribution to to any ECOWAS, even CEDAW, ECOWAS, or African Union, or whatever. So the things that we have, we have a long way we need to cross it. Uh, for sure, they are taking you as an example, as a presidential uh, system, example as a presiden presidential system, but for sure in the United States, even with the, with the, with the difficulties that, we, that they have now, they have an establishment that they are like provoking country from going to civil war at least even the, if the president have a power on the on the supreme court or whatever but we have some establishment who provoking to go to another to another catastrophic scenarios here in mali we are st still thinking about the primary steps of what we can do for is not for enhancing democracy but also to like to begin the pro the a democratic process. All, all this time in Mali, in the old history in Mali, we don't have a democratic transition. We don't have an election. Elected, but transparent, democratic election. It's like it's like we are changing power by, 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 by coup d'etat or by like force or whatever, or but like manipulated election. So to yeah, and start the route of planting some of uh, democratic uh, uh, behaviors is something good. So go to an, an, at least to a referendum and then to do something like this is what uh, Roberto, like I think he, he need to, to intervene here because he, he just like. I know, I know, but I'm, I'm, I'll bring him back in in a minute, but I, I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, in, in kind of uh, following up on, on what you've said there. I, you almost make it sound as if these basic uh, requirements, food, shelter, these sort of things, as if they were somehow lower down on the scale or they were kind of somehow, you know, the things that lesser developed it's countries not, deal, not, with or have to deal with. But obviously, in a way you can think of it, you know, and, and of course, I'm sure uh, John and Roberta have you know, a, a much better theoretical sort of like uh, understanding of this, but surely you can think about it of some kind of sort of, if you like, pyramid of requirements. I don't want to say needs because it goes, it's not just needs, but, you know, of course, in the US or in Europe, of course, For there sure. are issues For around sure. food, there are issues around, you know, food security, there are issues around shelter. I mean, there's issues around the kind of the growing gap and the kind of the massive, increasingly massive concentration of wealth uh, in very few hands. Is, so at many of the issues that, if you like, that, that, that Mali or developing countries grapple with, like, 
in the forefront, like as, as a sort of a primary concern, uh, of course, is a fundamental concern in Europe and the US. Exactly. And, and, yeah, exactly. and so, because if you don't have food security, if you don't have, you know, a roof over your head, if you don't have basic security, uh, you know, in every sense of the word, then all this other stuff built on tops, it really exactly. is built on sand. Okay, but 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 let me explain one thing because I think I need to to make a small introduction of Mali and then we can sort of okay. Uh, if I, I if I may said like Mali is the most uh, the most poverty in Africa is in Mali, so Mali is uh, most of the citizen I, I can say like uh, ninety percent of the citizen of, of Mali they don't have electricity, even to their houses. The most of people of Mali, 90%, I can say they don't have fridge. They don't know, they don't need a fridge because they don't have this privilege to have something to put it in the fridge. So what I am talking about, when, when I am talking about this primary needs, I'm not talking about food security. I am talking about existing of the food is the first step. And then we are talking about food security in the next step. Because most of them, Okay, most of the Malians they are living on what one is like is like fifty dollars per month. When I can say that my electricity bill per month is around seven hundred dollars. I, yeah, absolutely. But the, you know, you, I mean, we we're talking about the kind of the, uh, the kind of economic situation in Mali earlier. You know, the kind of yeah. that there is, the, you know, the, the the lack of rule of law, the lack of contractual, exactly. you know, security, the lack of exactly. um, the lack of also um, so secure uh, supply chains, or, or or you know, just exactly. Uh, and, and so, exactly. So, so 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 these are all, of course, fundamental issues. And of course, once they're being addressed and solved, then hopefully more food will end up on you know on Mali's uh, actually it was uh, it, it, it was only an expression to 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 show you where's the level of thinking and now the malian if you are talking about the malians they don't care about the constitution it's like because of this the the, the participation was around 38 37 percent even if it was the first the, the, the fourth republic the, the the first constitution since long time lots of people need it or they know that they need it but they don't care about it because they are like concerning about many other things. So the, the issue here is not only about what people need, what people want, what people what, what people need is not what people want. So uh, now in Mali, they are thinking about what people need is not what people want, because you need one, two, three, and you want uh, th four, five, six. So like there's some difference between this. So uh, to think to 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 have this constitution, even with with their with their like, okay, it's not the, the perfect constitution, it's beyond to, to be perfect, beyond to be democratic, beyond beyond many things, but in, at least it's a one step ahead to at least uh, uh, stabilize the country, to go at least to a presidential or legislative elections that will lead to some kind of legitimate authority, elected authority that can start over probably they will start by amending this constitution. I don't know. But at the end, we need to have a one uh, starting point that we can go from it, from one point, uh, point A to uh, a point B. So, so, uh, what, what, what's interesting here, I'll bring you in in a second, uh, Roberto. What's interesting here is, is that um, both John and Roberto, and you, of course, as well, have made this point very forcefully um, that in order for a constitution and any constitutional development or reform process to have legitimacy, it is absolutely critical that people can relate to what's in the constitution. And so, of course, because the context within which Europeans or North Americans and people in Mali live are so very different, of course, that would be kind of quite different. So for an, a North American to, to relate to their constitution is quite different, say, from what a European would like to see in order to relate to that constitution. Uh, but I think, um, uh, uh, Roberto, you have made this point quite strongly and quite clearly uh, why you think that, you know, that 
a reform process in Europe would be possible, indeed almost inevitable, because there is a sort of demand. It's kind of driven in some ways. Um, but, maybe you could. But I wanted to comment uh, uh, on Ali's point, which I think is very important for uh, for everybody to understand. Uh, you need first to have food and security. Because if you don't have to eat and you risk your life every day to be killed, you and your family, because there is a civil war, there can be no development. There can be no investment, there can be nothing. And this is what Europeans don't understand. When there is this discussion in Europe about uh, uh, financing investment plan for Africa and so on, if you don't provide security as well, the money that goes there goes to, finance, to buy weapons uh, between the groups in the civil war. And this is true for Libya, is true for Mali, is true for all uh, Ethiopia and, and, and so on. When there was the comparison with the Marshall Plan, the Marshall Plan had two legs. You get the money if you accept the American military basis that would secure that the, the democratic regime in those countries would remain such by good or bad means. So there were two legs in the Marshall Plan and people forget this, they only remember about the money. But today, Europeans are willing to pour money into Africa, but are unwilling to have a military that can help stabilize the, the, those countries, without which there can be no development. And this is the problem for the European. For the African, I think that what, uh, uh, the, from the African perspective, they can uh, uh, learn something from the European experience after the Second World War, where we also were not democracies, and we were trying to build one. And the European integration was crucial for this. And I think that from this perspective, it's much easier to have a multi-level democracy than a national one. And the best experience for this is India. India has been the poorest country in the world for decades, with millions of people dying by hunger every year, and has remained democratic. Because to have an authoritarian term, you need to take control of both the federal government in India and all the government of the Indian member states. Just like development in Europe was very much linked to the creation of the European economic integration and creating a larger market. So from that point of view, your reference to ECOBAS and the African Union, in my view, is very important. Because if we want Africa to develop, it's very important to strengthen local integration. Because development is much easier between tra with trade between countries at the same level of development than with countries at different levels of development. That was uh, help uh, European countries that were all rebuilding after the war and helped them a lot while they were much uh, behind the United States at that point. But by creating a custom union that defending them from American competition and creating trade among themselves helped them reach the level of the US. So from that point of view, to stabilize uh, uh, any attempt of democratic transition in all countries in Africa, trying to build and to strengthen those regional integration, I think it's very important. It's not a federal system like was India, nor is uh, integration strong as was the European one, but is the, the element that you can try to uh, uh, use to stabilize a little bit the situation, to put some pressure against authoritarian terms and so on. So I think that when we think about democratic transition, we need not to think only national terms, but also by exploiting what we have of regional integration in Africa, in your case, the ECOWAS and the African Union. Roberta, I think this is this is opening really a very interesting discussion, but it kind of, I think, goes beyond the scope of this discussion for, for a number of reasons. For starters, I think when, when you look at Africa, you have to take the colonial history uh, into account. Um, and, and also when you're putting boots on the ground, when you're putting troops, you know, armies into countries, this isn't always a way of stabilizing a country. Just think Afghanistan, think whatever. So, you know, I, I think that kind of whether Europe should follow up with a kind of a military kind of response on, on, on aid, I, I think that would be very, very, in some cases that makes sense, but I think it's a whole debate and it's a very difficult one to, uh, to square. Uh, I don't think we should go in Africa militarily. I think that we need to have a military that if there is a country that requires uh, stabilization help, we are able to do it. It's a different thing. Oh, I, I think, Roberto, absolutely. But I think, the, I think the general recognition is clearly there that you need rule of law and that you need security. 
um, as a basic, as, as a basic, and you need enforceability of law, of course, as a basic condition for development. The question just is how you get there, and I think that is a very, very difficult one, especially in Africa. But John, maybe you have some ideas here. Yes, um, maybe I, I could just lay out a scenario for you, which um, uh, would be a kind of a wish, you know, a hope for 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 country like for Mali and and other countries in, in West Africa and the Sahel region that, that are struggling. So imagine that in the case of Mali that, you know, um, the new constitution is, you know, coming into effect. There's a presidential election. I'm a little worried about how strong the presidency is now going to be in Mali. I mean, clearly that is a reflection of the military leadership there. Um, but, um, you know, if that election goes on uh, without a hitch, let's hope, uh, and the new uh, administration may be, you know, um, bringing in some foreign aid to help with this, is able to start rolling out electricity to more households in Mali. Um, so people actually see, you know, that this elected president under the new constitution is doing something. People start to believe in this institution and to uh, and to care more about it. And then imagine a further step, which I think is what Roberto is sort of suggesting, that um, uh, you know, that the uh, ECOWAS organization or a broader organization of West African countries or countries across the Sahel even um, and, and, and the far west of Africa were able to create a customs union um, and, and to, you know, slowly but, but surely build that up. Um, would there be a need, you know, like under the Marshall Plan in Europe for some kind of stabilizing security forces? Well, Perhaps, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe ECOWAS or a branch of the, the African Union could perform this function. To me, there would be a role there, possibly for Western advisors, not too many, you know, a fairly small presence, but uh, trainers, advisors. Um, uh, my other work, the, the League of Democracies book, um, imagines something like this role for a, a globalized NATO, but even the existing NATO could, could potentially take on such a, a democracy building mission where essentially what the, the union would, what the uh, um, the alliance would provide rather is, um, well, security forces, police, civil servants who are not corrupt, but they're on temporary loan uh, to a developing country. So imagine for five years uh, that, you know, most of the military uh, presence to stabilize the situation would be from ECOWAS, but there would also be a certain number of uh, NATO trainers and advisors, but also civilian staff, people who can run or help run local police forces, um, uh, just perform, you know, basic functions of government, like, uh, you know, running the tax system or financing schools. Uh, this sort of thing would greatly strengthen institutions in developing countries like Mali, uh, but in a way that ultimately, you know, what it leads to is not foreign domination, but people believing in the capacity of their own government to help them. Uh, that would be my, you know, kind of most hopeful scenario. I think one of the problems, and I think, um, uh, you know, Ali, you can probably say a little bit more about this, is in, in places like uh, uh, Mali, is, is that there's different sort of like, if you like, frames of reference. I mean, the, the, this sort of constitutional frame of reference, the rule of law, is really something that you know, Europeans brought to Africa in, in a way. It's, it is in some ways quite closely also associated with colonialism. In fact, the whole notion of the nation state is not really an African concept, really. Uh, so, um, so and, and we've drawn this like uh, with the ruler, we have kind of split out Africa into countries and quite, you know, totally ignoring what's, you know, what's, what's in it and what's not. So there is a kind of a, a geography and you know, like like frames of reference that don't really, you know, dovetail very well with our own. Uh, and there's always the risk if we think about Marshall plans and whatever for Africa that we're really kind of just carrying on colonial colonializing Africa. So I, I think we have to be very very careful uh, ab about that kind of approach. Um, I mean, I, I think this is a great opportunity for Ali. I mean, what do you think? What would you expect of Europe or uh, of, of North America to contribute? Actually, what, what is a meaningful contribution here? Actually, uh, uh, the main problem 
with uh, with all the intervention in Africa, humanitarian, whatever, democratic uh, programs, whatever, we are we are dealing as we are bringing like cooking receipts. So we are like we know how to do rice. So we we add rice, we add water, we add salt, and everything will be fine. We forget that that we have we have culture here that you, you need to be you need to deal with it. We have histories that we need to deal with it. This is a country with like thousands of years of histories that they are like having in their background. So they are like you cannot you cannot change them with a receipt. The democracy is not a receipt. Humanitarian is not a receipt. It's not like you you, you do one two three and it's fine. It's nothing you can build it in one and two and or three years. First of all, we, we, we need to stop the things that is like, okay, we have like a program of five years and this will establish the country. If you need to, if you need to enhance people's capability and ability to go forward in their future, and because this provides security for all the, the for, 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 for the whole world, it's not, and if we are providing security for Africa, that providing security for Europe and providing security for, for United States and providing security for, for Middle East, because all the problem is related. So when we are really trying to deal with the things as we deal with it in our own country. So we have a strategic plan to have this, to help the economic of, I don't know, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Burkina Faso, the other country, because also we are relying on them in many things. We are relying in, on them in their minefields. We are, we are like, we are, we are taking everything as, as natural resource from these countries. We are, we are like uh, uh, gold, uh, lithium, uranium, whatever we are taking from this country to enhance our to enhance our future and to, 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 to enhance our, 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 our technology. So why we don't invest in this country as we invest in our country if we are, we are relying on them and they are relying on us. So let's, just, let's make this partnership as a partnership. It's not a program of five years. Okay, we will give like 5, 000, 5, 5 million euro to, 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 to Mali to establish a democracy. It's not like this. You cannot establish democracy like this. You need education in Mali. You need to enhance the civic. You need to enhance the, the education system. You need to enhance the rule of law, and it's not in the American or uh, or uh, European way. We need uh, at least to know the to know the history of the country. We need to deal with the culture of this country. So when we are when we are dealing here with like when we are when we when we were trying to to find a solution. For the 18 national language and on which language we need to, 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 to have an official language. So it's like, okay, like, okay, let's see. We can we can say, okay, all the all the 18 languages is, is a national language, but the language of work, it's this language. And we are told, okay, the French, because the French, everybody knows the French, so the French is the work language, but the, all the 19, 18 language is an official. National language of Mali because you cannot you cannot like say like even if like five percent of the country is talking about uh, in one language you cannot exclude them. So this is the same. when we change the, our prospect of how to intervene in any country. We we, we know we only two aspects of intervention. This is what we what we know in all the different. We have like troops. We send troops, or we have okay. We have like this funding for five years, three years, whatever. How you can change someone? If you are doing funding for, for, for five years for a program and you have and you have someone on his head every day since 20 years repeating the same things, you cannot you cannot compete. So if you need to do this, you need to establish a fundamental partnership because this partnership you will be benefit from many things, and they will be benefit from many things, and will be on the same level. And it's partenariat is not we are like contributing to uh, enhancing their life. It's, it's partnership things. It needs to be partnership. It's not need to be donors and, and, and someone receiving funds. And because this is the issue, because they are looking at all whites here. We are with their, like the white people, uh, the clan, that's where we are the enemy because 
really like is there's no matter you are uh, you are you are from europe you are from france or you are from america you are from middle east from lebanon where i where i am because like okay you are white so you are part of the enemy because we create with our behavior here is this like logic of that we are here to like just to uh make charity for you and that's what make lots of block on enhancing our partnership or or enhancing our uh assistance to this to this country so first of all i think we need to change this this aspect of intervention to to do is more partnership is not intervention is more partnership because we are relying on them i know i know i know lots of of mines uh, the fields here like for 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 gold for for lithium for everything is like going to europe so we're like okay so like our phone is like essentially it's from here so I mean, this is this is a, I think this is a very very good uh, point to like uh, to 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 reflect on um, is is that when 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 you say partnership, you really mean a partnership of of equals, and you're not just talking exactly. about neighboring countries, but you are specifically also talking about what would currently be called donor countries, like European European countries or indeed North uh, American countries. That's that's a very very interesting, and of course the the model that you can build from there is kind of quite different, and of course built into this, and I think this is also really really critical. Is I think we are in in the West, in the sort of like post industrial West. Um, in so many areas now, be it in with artificial intelligence, be it with climate change, be it with all kinds of, we are actually now at a point where our old truths no longer seem to hold, where we no longer seem to have all the answers. You know, so we're no longer the kind of all-knowing, highly developed countries, but we're just as much really um, you know, in the dark about how to develop our own countries, how to develop our own regions. And of course, the problems we face are quite different from the problems that you face in Mali. But the mindset of having to move forward kind of, you know, with one eye blind, uh, I think applies to, to both of those countries. And that, in a way, creates a great basis for partnership. Now, I would like to now give both John and Roberto the opportunity to have a last few words to sort of reflect on what they took away from today's conversation, um, and and um, and then basically wrap up after that. Uh, maybe I start, uh, Roberto. Maybe I start with you, and then I finish uh, off with John at the end. Well, at the end of the day, constitution uh, are a framework for uh, living and uh, for providing public goods, and different areas of the world uh, have focus on different uh, kind of public goods on the basis of the level of development. But at the end of the day, that's the issue. Uh, in, in Mali, it may be providing food, security, and shelter. In the European Union, it's providing a defense against the Russian invasion or, or, or of Ukraine or uh, vaccines and the economic relaunch of the, the pandemic. But at the end of the day, it's about public goods. And uh, the other issue is we need uh, a world constitution because climate change and other problems have a global character and we need uh, some form of global constitution to find out way to provide global public goods, which require collective action at the global level. This will be the next challenge we'll probably need to deal with. Roberto, thank you very much. Um, uh, John? Well, I agree with that. Um, the League of Democracies proposal is meant to to offer kind of a um, a plausible way of doing that. It wouldn't include every country at first, but uh, uh, a wide enough network to create, um, uh, you know, secure ways of uh, of providing and securing most global public goods, at least. Um, let me just come back to to Mali, if I may, for for a moment. Um, we're almost yeah, we're talking at. Well, now the global level uh, versus you know individual countries, uh, Nico. I think you were exactly right to say that we, we've kind of, in a way, come back to being equally baffled or one-eyed blind. That was a good a good phrase. Um, uh, we're struggling so much, as the American case illustrates. Um, I have great fears for what's going to happen next year. I have to be honest. I mean, we could get to a point where there's actually uh, some kind of a real constitutional crisis or 
or a breakdown. The same thing may be happening in Israel is another example. Um, uh, Spain, Spain worries me greatly as well. But I mean, perhaps it would actually, in a paradoxical way, it might actually strengthen uh, European countries and the United States um, if we could stop focusing so much on our own kind of internal hatreds, but also instead more on what we can do to help people around the world. And, and Ali, I mean, that point about like the white savior complex, I, I'm glad to say I think it's becoming more widely recognized. Uh, in Western cultures. Uh, I mean, you may know this, but my students always say this to me. I mean, we can't approach this as white savior. We just come in with bundles of money. Um, clearly, this is one of the mistakes the United States made in Afghanistan. Um, we're, we're missing something in between. You know, we've got these rich donors um, <clears throat> trying to provide vaccine plans and so on. I mean, that's all good. And then we've got, you know, military presence, but both of these things can be alienating it seems to me what we're missing is that sort of, you know, civil servants without borders. We've got doctors without borders. We've got big donors. But imagine, you know, that we could bring civil ser servants to try to help African countries in the course of development so that, you know, in the worst case scenario, if a country's really struggling, it might be no more than, say, 10 percent uh, of uh, the civilian staff and different government institutions that would be, as it were, on loan. Uh, from a you know from some kind of a a, a global or regional organization it could be ECOWAS uh, plus NATO it could be ECOWAS plus a European force um, but something that doesn't just look like military and we actually have I think at this point both in Europe and the United States we would have the potential to say if you're volunteering to serve on this kind of a mission five or ten years even. Um, you know, in, uh, say, a West African country, um, we already do this to some extent with medical staff, right, with sending people when there's an, as with the Ebola outbreak in, in Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, and so on. Um, so imagine that uh, we could try to recruit people in Europe and the United States who weren't sort of quite as white as I am, let's put it that way, right? Um, you know, I mean, we do have a lot of people here, we could say, well, look, I mean, if you're a person of color uh, serving in the American military, we have special incentives for you. We would like you to consider volunteering for a five-year mission, um, you know, in, in a West African deployment. And the same thing could be done in Europe. I don't think we could make it exclusive, but we could say, look, you know, it will help our mission if we can recruit more people in our countries with some African ancestry. I I mean, then what happens is, you know, hopefully you know, on such a deployment, if the civilian staff or military advisors are behaving well, they may see, of course, they'll still see them as American or European. But, yeah, I'd like to ask Ali, do you think that would help? Absolutely. I, I think, I think you know, I think that is a fundamental uh, sort of like insight we, we've all had in different contexts. I mean, I think I, I'm sure Roberto could tell us long stories about how uh, the Erasmus program, for example, or other kind of like exchange programs, or there's a horizontal kind of like best practice uh, uh, thing going on across European EU member states, where at, at sort of local level, uh, civil servants from one city or from one region would then kind of uh, you know, into, into dialogue and often even kind of, you know, go there for some time uh, on around best practice. And I think this way of kind of sharing experience of kind of getting a better insight and uh, it has, of course, the, the dual benefit of helping others, but also learning a lot more yourself as well. And I think especially the US, if I may say this, from a European or kind of a global perspective can very often come across quite insular because it's, of course, it's such a large you know, continent and, you know, there's no need for like the average American to ever leave his state or her state, never mind the United States. Um, so I don't know what portion of Americans ever have been to Africa or to Europe or to Asia or whatever. So all they get is, is whatever it is, is, you know, uh, through, through the media. And of course, that often isn't enough. Can I quickly add something on this? Just very short, Nico, yes. sorry to interrupt. But see, that's part of what's in my mind is that it would help Americans if they were sort of forced to get out of this country for a year or two at least, I mean, it's a kind of a serious problem. And we should probably require this of every American 
um, even in high school to spend a summer abroad or something. But imagine that we could promote, you know, more um, civil servants, staff or, um, you know, Americans who are maybe even in some kind of a military post doing foreign service. I really think it would help us internally. So this is not an unselfish proposal. <laughs> And of course, I mean, I think probably, you know, as if not more important would be to provide scholarships and fellowships for African uh, um, scholars, politicians, activists, um, businessmen, you know, entrepreneurs, um, um, and of course, technocrats to, to come to Europe, to come to North America, to share what they know and to learn what, what we can tell. So to have that, but to really think of it as a two-way street, not as going there, but really um, as, as an exchange, uh, as an equal exchange of equals. Thank you ever so much, guys. I think this must have been the longest uh, reboot uh, uh, dialogue so far. We're kind of getting close to two hours. I'm really, really grateful for having you all here. This has been an amazingly interesting uh, conversation. May I say if any of our viewers has managed to stay the course and is still listening or viewing, um, we will put on some more information about uh, the, the stuff we talked about. So uh, here's some homework, uh, John, for you, uh, for Ali, for you, and, and Roberta, for you. If anything you said is backed up with, I mean, of course, John, you've just come out with a book. Um, you may have links to other books. If people want to read up about your stuff, it would be great if you could send me some links. Roberto, if you have got okay. some information that, you know, about the, uh, the conference on Europe and, and you're thinking about how this is moving forward, um, please, again, maybe send me an email and I put them on below this video. And the same, Ali, if you've got any any interesting stuff that sure. our viewers or listeners would like to, to follow up on, uh, please do. And of course, if anybody wants to get exactly. in touch with any one of us i'm sure that can be facilitated too thank you ever so much um uh, john davenport um and thank you very much roberto thank you very much uh, ali it's been a great pleasure to have you today thank you thank you thank, thank you. you so much thank you thank Hope you bye-bye